PTF back with you. Breeders' Cup betting challenge diaries. We're getting close now, folks. Less than two weeks to the Breeders' Cup. We'll kick off the show as we so often do by giving some shout outs to recent BCBC qualifiers, starting with Jim Settle, Anthony Schiavone, Stephen Meyer, Matthew Ake, Russell Powell, Robert Salzano, Ron Faris, Brian Gross, Joe Kramer, Kieran Thornton, Nicholas Smith, Jay Kawada, Joe Johnson, Brian Chenvert. Timothy Brockle, and Ken Seaman. A couple of those are partial $5,000 qualifiers, but you get the idea. There's been a flurry of action, places like ExpressBet, and of course, horseplayers.com. We've got another one coming up this Thursday. It's the Horse Players Happy Hour finale. We want you to get involved in that $179. And the great wrinkle on these contests is that the house cut goes to charity so you're supporting great causes thoroughbred aftercare alliance and therapeutic horses of saratoga all while you get an opportunity to punch your ticket to the breeders cup betting challenge in terms of other contests we've got coming up there is a lot of action still going on from our friends at santa anita both on track and over at express bet expressbet.com slash tournaments place to check that out and horseplayers.com is going to have some feeders and qualifiers. Halloween, October 31st, is the BCBC last chance over there. Go to horseplayers.com and make sure you check out the full schedule there. Next up on the show, we bring in one of our three players we've been following all year long on Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge Diaries, the first of our three to punch his ticket to the BCBC. He's Tyler Hoffman. Tyler, what's been going on, man? Hey, Pete, how are you? I've been doing great. Just uh, getting excited as we get closer and closer to the Breeders' Cup. I know you're, uh, ba- the baseball fan in you is, is excited. And just to show you how magnanimous I am as a, you know, a Mets diehard, I'm even allowing a Dodger fan on the show this week. I j- just want to show that there's no hard feelings. Hey, Pete, that's very generous of you. I mean, the series went two more games than it should have since we pretty much gifted you games two and five. So, you know, glad you got to see six games of the NLCS. It was nice to be able to get one win at home. I will say that. And but I will, and the other thing is, what a terrible series if you were a neutral. Six games, none good. <laughs> All blowouts. Win. No lead changes until the first inning of game six. That's insanity for a play- baseball playoff series. We'll see how it plays out uh, with the Yankees and Dodgers. That's going to be a fun backdrop for um, Breeders' Cup week. But, of course, our brains are going to be deep in the form. I know you've been thinking about this for a long time. Wanted to touch base with you on how you are doing in your preparations for this year's BCBC. Yeah, I haven't done too much. Um, I mean, really, you don't want to form too many opinions at this point until the the draw actually comes out and you can see post positions and odds and and all of those types of things. For me, I more want to just familiarize myself, go back through, uh, do a little bit of of a study guide research paper that I kind of put together for myself. I went back and I, I watched every single replay of the win in your in races from the beginning of the season in every country all the way through, you know, uh, last weekend, essentially. And basically just have kind of general notes and thoughts on all of those races. I know a lot of those runners probably won't be running. Obviously, some will. But it's just good to have an idea for where, uh, you know, horses that are either going to be coming out of some of those races that maybe were behind those winning your in horses. And kind of get an understanding of, especially on the, uh, the European side of things, of where those horses might stack up come this time of year. Well, that makes sense. Do you have anything this far out that you have a really strong feeling you will be betting? Or does that type of preparation, like you were intimating, not really happen until you have full fields and post positions? No, I don't really don't have any opinions yet on, on the Breeders' Cup uh, you know, card itself. I mean, obviously, there are some runners that stand out. You know, A horse like Cogburn, you know, is going to be a pretty big favorite in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. He's obviously done nothing wrong. He's, he's fast, fast, and faster, it seems like, with each prep race you watch this year. Obviously, he's going to have the big Kentucky Downs stat going against him. You know, runners coming out of Kentucky Downs and run at the Breeders' Cup in California are like 0 for 41 and like 0 for 101 or something since 2014. So, you know, those kinds of stats are, are going to play a factor, I'm sure, for a lot of handicappers out there. We'll see where it falls in my decision-making come the, uh, the first weekend of November. That's a really interesting one. Where did you pull that from? Where did that stat come from? I read that on Twitter, and I, I want to say I saw that from Ed DeRosa. But if it was Ed DeRosa, my apologies. But uh, <laughs> somebody definitely tweeted that. I read that the other day, and it was fascinating to read. One of the reasons why I don't do much on Twitter in terms of scrolling and don't listen to other podcasts is I'm terrified of being in the exact situation you just were. You know, you're a guest on the show. Like, you don't have the same onus to give credit. But if I come on here and I don't know who said what, then – 
then I, I feel like a heel. So it, it's, uh, <laughs> I, tr- I just try to stay in the bunker, um, look for my own stuff, and then I don't get uh, get stuck with that. But it's fascinating. Personally, I don't think it means all that much. None of those horses were anywhere near as fast as Cogburn is, but it is a fun little discussion point as we move forward. You're somebody who's known for the work you do, um, trip handicapping. You talked about going back and looking at the win in your in races. How do you reconcile that type of work with the kind of work you do when you have the fields and the post positions in terms of what uh, Duke Matisse and Paul Matisse referred to as designing a race, trying to envision how it's going to be run in your mind before they actually pop the gate? Is that part of what you have in your arsenal, the idea of trying to see what's going to happen out there in terms of trips before the race? Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, my whole upbringing in racing was setting up and designing a race in my head. And going through the PPs and organizing in that format. Trip handicapping has always just been a supplemental piece to the overall handicapping process. On a card like the Breeders' Cup, I mean, trip handicapping, yes, it has value to it. But again, you're mostly watching horses that have won their last race or have won their, their prep races and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's not a whole lot of information you can really, truly learn um, on a card of this just because these are the best of the best. So, it's not a traditional day of, of handicapping where, you know, horses are getting education runs and stuff like that. So... For me personally, until the, the draw comes out and until we really get to see the PPs, that's when opinions will start to form, start to look for, you know, race setups. Maybe there's a race that drew less speed than what was originally figured to be, or maybe there's a race that looks like it's a heck of a lot more contentious. Or my personal favorite, what if the post-time favorite is drawn to a post that is just miserable and how are they going to overcome that trip? And now that race is totally flipped on its head compared to what it looked like leading up to the race. A horse like Cogburn, for example, since we're already on the, the topic of him. I mean, he's run great everywhere. So it really shouldn't matter that the Breeders' Cup's held at Delmar this year and that he's run at, you know, Kentucky Downs and Belmont and Churchill and et cetera throughout the course of the year. But what happens if he draws post 12, let's just say, and there's a couple of, you know, really quick horses to his inside and he can't get over? Does that play a role in your handicapping? It might, might not. And that's all part of the fun puzzle that's putting the Breeders' Cup uh, selections together. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again post-draw to you and to Justin and to Jackson and talk about this stuff when we have the draw in hand. Really looking forward to, to speaking with you on the eve of the event, which we'll do in some format, hopefully right here on BCBC Diaries next week. One more for you. We get the pre-entries right about the time this pops up on YouTube. The pre-entries are going to be out. We're going to have actual past performances. How much work do you do from pre-entries until we have the proper draw on Monday. How does that early part of the process work for you? So for me personally, I just kind of like knowing which of the European runners or Japanese runners are really have entered and are serious about coming over. That helps kind of narrow down my preliminary notes. It gives me a little bit of a head start in handicapping those specific runners and kind of going back through some of their tapes uh, and kind of understanding their format of where they the races that those trainers selected to run those horses I actually put some time. Uh, I spent some time putting together the European and, and French racing calendars so I could better understand where those group ones and group twos are staged throughout the course of the year and how that gets laid out. And I'm hoping that's going to be a little bit bigger of a factor for me in understanding how they trained up to the Breeders' Cup and the way that the racing campaign went throughout the course of the year. So that's where that'll come in with the pre-entries. We're going to have a ton of information about the shippers, both on Breeders' Cup, social media, and YouTube. We're going to be doing a deep dive into Uh, the European and Japanese contenders also over at uh, the In The Money Media YouTube channel where our friends at the JRA, we're going to go through all those horses. Going to be a lot of great info for people to check out. And then we're going to touch back with you, hopefully, and the rest of the team next week as well in this space. Tyler, any more uh, qualifying opportunities for you? Are you you content going here single-barreled? Might you go double-barreled? And if you already have two, might you try to get a third before it's all said and done? Uh, and so for right now, obviously I'm single barreled, but I will be playing in San Anita's closing day contest. There are a couple different prizes you can win in that tournament. It's a, it's a $1,500 tournament, 500 to the, to the entry pool and a thousand, uh, for the bankroll. So looking forward to going after that one and, uh, hopefully getting a little appetizer for the Breeders' Cup in the, uh, in the tournament scene. That's on Sunday, right? Yes, sir. And you can also play over at ExpressBet, expressbet.com slash tournaments, the place to check that out as well. Breederscup.com slash BCBC will also give you that list again of remaining qualifying opportunities on horseplayers.com. The one we're most excited about, of course, Thursday, Horseplayers Happy Hour Season Finale. Tyler, we'll check in with you one more time before the big dance, but we'll wish you Godspeed. Until then. Thank you.
For Tyler, I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. Thanks so much to all our friends at the Breeders' Cup for sponsoring these shows, and I'll see you on the leaderboard.